We'll get started right now. Thank you all for coming out. It's a beautiful night. We missed the rain, which is excellent. And I want to introduce one of our top advocates who him and his family have really done a lot to not only create wonderful awareness for ALS, but also raise a lot of money for research. So Paul Carey. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, friends of the family I have here, fellow advocates and advocates. Yes, that's all you, all you young ones. If we can get advocates trending on Twitter by the end of this, um, all, all, all be accomplished. Thank you for joining us tonight at the, the ALS Candlelight Vigil here at Freedom Plaza in our nation's capital. Again, my name is Paul Carey, and I'm very honored and excited to be able to play some small role tonight and stand along you as we fight against this terrible disease, ALS. I would be very regretful and most likely in trouble and maybe even grounded if I didn't start off by wishing all the moms here in person and in spirit a very happy Mother's Day. So a round of applause for mothers. My mom, Lori Carey, was diagnosed with ALS uh, 11 years ago now, and it's, it's very hard to believe. She is still my inspiration and the inspiration to so many others. Um, so, Mom, happy Mother's Day. I love you. I am very grateful to be able to, to spend Mother's Day with my mom and Advocacy Day again with my family, this being our, our 12th trip to Washington, D.C. for ALS Advocacy Day. I have a script here, which I'm, I'm also thankful for, but for those of you who, who know me and who have seen me speak previously know this is a bit unorthodox, having a script that is, especially here on ALS Advocacy Day, when we encourage you to be so fiercely unscripted. Sure, we have these leave-behind packages that we want to hand off with our congressmen, and we have certain bills we want to lobby for and legislate for, and we have a certain cadence to our meetings with congressmen, but you're really here to tell your story. I remember my very first advocacy day, and my grandpa Dick was here, was here with us, and we were in a meeting with a congressman, and he started to cry. And it was one of those, is, like, is this real, what is life moments, when I did a double take, and I was said, is, is grandpa crying? And I turned, and he was, and he, he was in tears. The story, his emotion of his daughter being affected by ALS had, had moved him to tears, and it was such um, a powerful, a beautiful moment for me. And it was certainly off script. So I encourage each of you to be fearless in, in showing your vulnerability and sharing your, your struggles, your obstacles, whatever turmoil um, you are beleaguered with in your fight against ALS. Share your story, because that's what we're here to do. I went so far, I'm three pages in. Today you will hear three ALS stories of individuals from families who, like all of us, have been somewhat affected or touched, their lives changed by this tragic disease. You will first hear from Larry Kiman and Ryan Mink, who will share their family story with ALS. Kiman's mother, Jean, was, was diagnosed with ALS and eight years later took the life of Larry's mother, Frances. Following will be Kate Linder, who emceed this vigil for many years and who is the ALS Association's celebrity spokesperson. She will share the memory of her brother-in-law, Scott, who lost his battle with ALS just a few years ago and is the reason that Kate and her husband, Ron, continue to advocate for ALS across the country. Finally, 17-year-old Sarah Caldwell will tell us the story of her own ALS hero, her father, Jim who inspired his daughter to never stop fighting. Each of our speakers and those they honor has been a tremendous advocate for our cause. And while they and all of you are here tonight to pay tribute to those we have lost, we are also here to join together and with one voice proclaim that we will beat this disease. We will find a treatment and a cure for ALS. I was 13, my brother Christian, was 12. We were pulled into the family room by dad saying, I have bad news. I have bad news. Those were the words. And I think uh, we all know what that bad news was. My mom was going to die. 
You don't really know or understand tragedy un until it hits you. Uh, September 11th, 2001, I was in fifth grade, and I remember um, sitting in school in a uh, social studies class, and my teacher said the World Trade Centers had, had been hit. That, that was, uh, honestly, that was my first time hearing the World Trade Center. I had no idea what those were before that day. And then three years later, it's February, Friday the 13th, 2004, my mom has ALS. It's the first time I've ever heard of ALS. My brother and I are very close, and, and I'm, I know he's in, here in spirit tonight. He, he's in Portland. So he and I were, became very close after our mom was diagnosed, and neither of us had any knowledge about the disease. But we soon qu quickly realized the horrific truths of the disease, that it robs people of the ability to do things that we take for granted. The ability to walk and talk, to scratch an itch, to hug a loved one, to say, I love you, happy Mother's Day. For our mom, it, it took away her favorite hobby of, of doing arts and crafts with her hands. She loved to make crafts and still does. It's a bit more of a challenge now for our family and friends, for those holidays and birthdays and our favorite just because days. My brother and I soon realized that if we wanted to make a difference, we had to take it upon ourselves to do so. The, the great thing about having terrific parents and being young is that when they tell you you can do anything you put your mind to, you are audacious and, and naive enough to actually believe it. My brother and I started an organization, a platform called Kids for Cure, which still exists today, a name we have somewhat begun to outgrow. However, the message is still the same. We are two brothers trying to find a cure for ALS. We are based in our hometown of, of Cincinnati. Over the years, we've, we, we've had about 5,000 walkers join our team, wear our Kids for Cure walk t-shirts, and through their help and the rest of our community have raised nearly a million dollars for, for ALS Association through Kids for Cure. And the reason that I share this with you today is, is because that mission and that initiative that we took 11 years ago is exactly what we're doing here today in Washington, D.C., and that's to take action. Just last night, my mom pulled me aside she said, I have bad news. The same words, that I have bad news. And I said, okay, what, what is this? And she, she told me, she goes, you're not gonna be able to collect on my life insurance when I die, which is something I, I, don't, I don't think about, but I know she thinks about me taking care of me. And I say, why is that? She goes, because my insurance policy expires when I turn 65 and that's only 15 years away. So, as I light my candle tonight, I'm gonna hold my mom to that 15 year lease. And I will pray the same for you and for your loved ones. When all of us hold our candles in the air tonight, we're also saying that we will never give up, that we will take action and that we will end this disease. For the main reason that we gather here tonight in our nation's capital is to take action to urge our elected officials to join the fight against ALS, to make ALS personal for them too, so that our fight becomes their fight. That's the reason we're here, to make a difference. Speaking of fighting, it was just last weekend that I, like many millions Americans of Americans, tuned into what was claimed to be the fight of the century. If you didn't see us, this was a boxing match. It was Floyd Mayweather and uh, Manny Pacquiao. Now, one thing about my generation, at least where I grew up, is that I don't really get boxing. I, I know my dad was really into it, but I think that's like, you know, a bit prehistoric. I don't know. <laughs> that wasn't written down, by the way. That just came to me. I don't understand the scoring. I don't understand the hype. I don't understand how you win. But I, as I was you know, watching the fight of the century, I was, I was quite underwhelmed. And I realized that if that's the fight of the century, like what, what fight are we in? This must be the fight of the millennium, right? 
And that's really part of the message that we want to convey on Capitol Hill this Tuesday, that we are in a fight. And as an ALS community, we are very strong and we're not going to dance and we won't run away from punches because we are tough as one. We have taken many punches along the way and when we get, up, when we get knocked down, we will get right back up off the mat. While the bout is not over, we are definitely standing firm in the ring together. We live in a different ALS world today than we did just this time last year. This is the post ice bucket challenge world. People know who we are, but do they really? Do they know what it's like to live with ALS? Do they know what it's like to quit your job full time to take care of a loved one? Do they know that we still don't have a treatment? We still don't have a cure. So this is our charge, this is our, our opportunity, our creed to on this Thursday to turn that publicity into action. To seize on this opportunity to tell our story and our elected officials exactly how they can help us fight against ALS. In boxing terms, we want them in our corner so that one day rallies such as these will be about celebrating a cure we have found, not a fight to uncover one. And I know we can do this. We can make a difference because we have before. We eliminated the 24 month Medicare waiting period, something no other disease has ever done. Not AIDS, not cancer, not Alzheimer's. We secured unprecedented benefits for our ALS veterans. Everyone said we couldn't do it, but we, the ALS community, up off the mat, calloused, hardened, ready for battle, achieved it. This community has come together to accomplish many things, and we can do the same again this week. We can do it by making sure members of Congress not only know who we are, but they know our stories within. Here shortly, I will introduce our speakers. Following their remarks, we will light our candles and we will listen to a musical tribute by Master Sergeant Caleb Green. We will then pause to both pay tribute to those fighting with the disease and those lost to signal that we will never give up and we will continue this fight until we beat ALS. Following the candles, I will ask everyone just to stay a few moments longer so we can get uh, a, group, a group picture of this event. My last words, please remember that when you go to Capitol Hill on Tuesday, come armed with your experiences and your memories of your loved one. Tell your stories, they are powerful. Be fiercely unscripted. We will overcome this disease. We will find a treatment and a cure. Our first speaker this evening is Larry Mink, who will be joined by his wife, Kiman, and their son, Ryan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Larry Mink. This is my wife, Kiman, my son, Ryan. Kiman and I are both volunteers for the ALS Association. Kim Ann is on the National Board of Trustees, and I'm on the Board of Directors of the Michigan Chapter. Ryan's a senior at the University of Pittsburgh, majoring in psychology, and this summer, Ryan is doing an internship at the uh, ALS MDA Clinic Center of Hope in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, as with most of you, our family's commitment to the ALS Association and to Advocacy Day stems from our personal experience with ALS. Kim Ann and I met as chemistry graduate students at Duke University in the mid-1980s. And during that time, one of my research advisors was diagnosed with a disease that I knew very little about, except that it was associated with baseball legend Lou Gehrig. As I watched this professor battle the symptoms, which, was, which ultimately led him to resign from my committee, I learned a little bit about the disease. But given that I was told it was rare, I never expected it to impact my family. Unfortunately, I was very wrong. In 1998, Kim Ann's mother, Jean, was diagnosed with ALS. Jean was an incredibly strong and brave woman who, with the help of her husband, Charlie, would make the most of the time she was told she had left. Although Kim Ann and I were living in Philadelphia and Jean and Charlie lived in Florida, we visited Jean as often as we could. Each time was heartbreaking for us, however, as we saw Jean's symptoms progress. But Jean never complained or let her physical limitations pre pre prevent her from enjoying her time with her family. We had some wonderful times together that we still cherish. The last time we visited Jean, she was unable to talk or to even move her head. But I'll never forget looking into her eyes and seeing, feeling a great deal of love. 
Eyes truly are the windows to the soul. Shortly after that visit, Jean would succumb to ALS five years after her diagnosis. Sadly, it was not the last time we would lose a loved one to ALS. A little more than two years after Jean passed away, my mother, Frances, was visiting us for Christmas when, she, when, her, when her speech suddenly became slurred. Something was clearly wrong, but I dismissed, dismissed ALS as a possibility because I couldn't imagine that it would strike our family again. Besides, the symptoms for my mother were very different than Jean's. They were presenting very differently. It would take eight months for my mother to get her diagnosis, and as with Jean, that diagnosis was ALS. My mother's form of the disease was bulbar onset, and her symptoms progressed very rapidly. I visited her regularly, and each time I visited, I would take her for long drives through the horse farms of central Virginia. Mom said that it made her forget about ALS for a while. Those were our special times together. Three months after mom's diagnosis, she was unable to speak and was on a feeding tube. She still had enough strength in her hands, however, to write a farewell letter to each of her three children. I cherish that note as my last connection to my mother, and I still read it when I miss her. Mom died in December of 2006, less than four months after her diagnosis. Kim's mother and my mother had a lot in common, besides being co-in-laws and being stricken with ALS. Both were devout Catholics from Italian heritage. They were both very warm and loving people who would sac sacrifice anything for their children. But the one, thing, the one thing that our mother shared most was the love for our son, their grandson, Ryan. Ryan is our only child and my mother's only grandchild. There were so many pictures of Ryan in my mother's living room that we jokingly referred to it as a shrine. Both grandmothers doted on Ryan and took, um, <coughs> took every opportunity to spoil him. A grandmother's love is very special, but sadly, Ryan would lose both of his grandmothers by the time he was 12. While Ryan has some memories of his grandmothers, he should have had an opportunity to create many more. Unfortunately for him, ALS intervened. Kim Ann, Ryan, and I come to Advocacy Day every year to support the efforts of the ALS Association and through it those who are currently battling the disease. We're here tonight to remember and celebrate our mother's lives and to honor the, their memory by supporting those currently suffering with the disease and those working towards a cure for the disease that took our mothers from us. Most of you are here for Advocacy Day because you too have been directly impacted by this disease or perhaps you're, also, you're here to show support for others. Whatever your reason, please know that your participation is greatly appreciated by many people and it will make a difference in the lives of those afflicted by this horrific disease. On behalf of our moms, Jean and Francis, Kim Ann, Ryan and I thank you. Good evening, everyone. I would just like to take a moment um, as the music begins to speak to you about legacy. I hear a legacy of love and I hear a legacy of commitment. And um, as a professional musician in the Washington, D.C. area, the, the young men that are on this stage, really there's only one, but <laughs> the young men who are on this stage have uh, dedicated their lives to so many more greater causes than um, you could ever possibly imagine or causes greater than themselves. And I am the person that's highlighted on the program this evening, but it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you my son, Aaron Green, who walks alongside me in this journey of life, and he watches his dad, and he is right there with me every step of the way. He sees me when I do what's right, he sees me when I do what's wrong, but the fact remains that he sees me, and I would love for him to share with you the talent that God has given him this evening. Thank you.
change the world there's nothing to it there is no life i know to compare with pure imagination living there you'll be free if you truly Don't you love that song? It's great. And they love that song too, right? Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kate Linder. Thank you. And as Paul mentioned, I am the celebrity spokesperson for the ALS Association. And I've had the pleasure of uh, participating in the ALS Association's Advocacy Day and Public Policy Conference for many, many years, including emceeing this very, very special event. But tonight, I am here to share the ALS story of my brother-in-law, Scott Bazell. So one thing that everyone knew about Scott was that he was a great athlete. He was a champion golfer while playing for Arizona State, and he continued his passion for the game well after leaving Tempe, Arizona. And after college, Scott settled down and he married his beautiful wife, my sister-in-law, Georgianne. He was a wonderful, incredible husband and father to his two daughters, Sandra and Kristen. And I remember when Scott was initially diagnosed, he kept it a secret from nearly everyone except his family and closest friends. But like all of you here today, when my husband and Ron and I learned a loved one had received this diagnosis, well, that was it. We wanted to do anything and everything we could do to help as fast as humanly possible. And that is why I am very proud to be the celebrity spokesperson for the ALS Association. When Scott went public with his battle, he made it clear that this was his time to fight back. Together, Scott and Ron and I participated in walks. We raised money for research and advocated for policies that benefit people living with ALS and their families. Through the ALS Association, we created Kate's Club, a public awareness campaign to focus much needed attention to ALS. One of the proudest moments I have was Scott is when he came to CBS set of The Young and the Restless to film a PSA with me as part of the campaign. The power to act and fight that I saw in Scott's eyes on set that day is something that will remain with me forever. Scott was a very religious man and he turned to God and he put his faith and trust in him. And he refused to give in when things got rough which is why he chose to be on a ventilator in the hopes that a cure would come. But unfortunately, two years ago, Scott lost his battle to ALS. But before he passed away, he made it a point to encourage me to continue to work for a cure and a treatment. And that is why I am here today among all of you so that you will never walk alone because together we can make Scott's hope a reality. Now, Andrew Fleeson fought ALS also, and he once said, it doesn't matter how many breaths you take in this lifetime, but rather what you do with those breaths. And I intend 
to use every breath I have to fight until we have a cure. Isn't that right? Yes. And John and Robin Maurer, who also have fought this disease, and a lot of you will know what I mean when I say HTH. And what does that mean? Oh, you got it. You're right. It's hit the hill. So when you go to Capitol Hill on Tuesday and you tell your story or the story of your loved ones, you make sure that Congress knows that we will not stop until we get rid of this disease forever. Because we are never, never, never giving up. Thank you. Caleb, and thank you to our first two speakers. Our final speaker is Sarah Caldwell. Following her remarks, we will light our candles to honor our loved ones and symbolize our continued efforts and fight against ALS. Sarah. Okay, first of all, I would like to say Happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. Um, yeah. Um, moms are pretty uh, special people, and I know that I would not be where I am today, I would not be the person I am today without the support and love of my incredible mother who is out here today, so thank you. In the summer of 2012, my dad, Jim Caldwell, was diagnosed with ALS. I was 15 years old. I was 15 years old when I found out that my dad was gonna die, when I began to watch this disease overtake him little by little. We thought my dad was going to be on the slow progression track, one of the lucky people who lives five or more plus years after diagnosis. But all of you know how unpredictable ALS is, how it can strike any person, 
how it progresses through the body at an unpredictable rate. I was 16 years old when my father passed away. I was 16 years old when I was left without my father, my mentor, my hero. But if there was one thing that you should know about my dad, it is that he was a fighter. He refused to let ALS define who he was. He used to tell me that he would not stop doing anything until he absolutely could not do it anymore. My dad was not frustrated that he was sick. People get sick. He was frustrated that there was nothing anyone could do to stop this disease. Well, nothing anyone could do at the time. Because I am confident that in the future, people with ALS won't have to think that way. I'm confident that we will find a cure. My dad lost his battle with ALS just 16 months after diagnosis. But up until the very end, he continued to live life to its fullest. He continued to fight no matter how hard it got. I guess that's why I've continued to fight ALS. I've organized fundraisers and walks, and I distribute ALS awareness bracelets nationwide. I also recently published a book it's called Just to Make You Smile, detailing my experiences with my dad's battle with ALS, with the hopes of helping other people who have dealt with loss and grief, specifically young adults with sick parents. And I'm fortunate enough that Steve Gleason agreed to write the foreword to the book as well. As you all are well aware of, last summer's Ice Bucket Challenge brought attention to ALS in ways no one could have ever imagined. But now it's our job to keep that hype going, because as I've always said, the more attention that is drawn toward this disease, the more funds that will be allocated towards research to help find a cure. That's why we're all here today, to advocate for this disease, to try to convince our senators and representatives of the funding ALS deserves. But we are also here to listen to the stories of other people affected by ALS the disease that we feel like no one else understands. But here, everyone gets it. All of you get it. All of you understand how devastating it is to see someone you love get weaker and weaker right before your eyes, and, therefore, and for there to be almost nothing that you can do. Everyone here also has their own story of sadness and joy, their own story of wisdom and perseverance that can inspire us all to continue on this journey to living and to finding a cure for ALS. My dad was, and still is, my hero. He's the man who I always looked to for advice and find myself looking to even more now that he's gone. We couldn't save my hero, but I know that I can be part of something that could help save the life of someone else's hero to make a difference in the life of someone in the future affected by ALS. And for me, that is reason enough to continue fighting this insidious disease. Because there was no cure when my dad was sick, but once again, I'm confident that there will be a treatment, a cure, in the future. I'm confident because of the mass courage, perseverance, and determination that I have seen in all you researchers, doctors, and pals, all you caregivers, family members, children, and friends of anyone affected by ALS, every single one of you out there. Because we stand together and we will do it. We can do it. We will win in the fight against ALS. Thank you.
prove you wrong If you think I'm all talk Then you're in for a shock Cause this dream's too strong In before too long Maybe I'll compose symphonies Maybe I'll fight for world peace Cause I know it's my destiny To leave more than a trace of myself in this place I wanna do something that matters Say something different Something that sets the whole world on its ear I wanna do something better With the time I've been given And I wanna try Something that says I was here 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 God bless you